evening. We're on the eve of Ascension Day, and we are going to be hearing from the scriptures some preparatory texts that bring us toward the Ascension of Jesus. This is one of the seven great principal feasts of the year in at least the Anglican rendition of the church calendar. And on this day, as the name suggests, this is when Jesus ascended bodily into heaven. And by this day, I mean, uh, I'm recording this on Wednesday evening, so by this day, I mean tomorrow. Thursday, Ascension Day, is the 40th day after Easter, because as the scriptures note, it was 40 days when Jesus ascended. So, let us begin in prayer. Almighty God, whose only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into heaven, may our hearts and minds also there ascend, and with him continually dwell, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, starting at verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Kedileomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that is Abraham, at the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him, a, gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. Thus the first reading. The second lesson is from the Epistle to the Hebrews, starting in chapter 7, in verse 11, and continuing into chapter 8, verse 6. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what for the need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made with a, was, was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 
For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Thus ends the reading. And our gospel is from that of Luke at the end of chapter 24, starting in verse 44. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance or the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, blessing God. The Gospel of the Lord. So the message that I wanted to share today would be entitled, The High Priest Enters His Temple. There is much to be said about the ascension of Jesus, what it means for him to go into heaven. There is a great devotional aspect to that reality, to realize that somehow, in some mystical sense, we who are in Christ are in heaven with him in some way. As he is human, he has taken his humanity before the full glory of the triune God, unmitigated from limitations of the world. And by bringing his human body with him, because Jesus is one person, both man and divine, we see a sure and certain promise there that other humans, like us, might also be before God, truly in heaven someday. So we know it's possible. It can be done. <laughs> we who are in Christ may there ascend with him. And that is one of the greatest promises of the Christian gospel. There's also an aspect of kingship. As he is seated at the right hand of the Father, this is taking a throne. And there is much to be sung and said and heard and preached along those lines. Crown him with many crowns, as we would most, perhaps most famously sing. But there's another angle that I wanted to focus on, which is the priest entering the temple. This is what we hear in Hebrews, and the prototype of this is given in Genesis 14 with the mysterious character of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is presented as the king of Salem, and he's also a priest, a priest of God which is a very interesting combination to be both priest and king, 
hardly anyone in the scriptures are both. Many of the good kings of Israel did priest-like things occasionally, David, Solomon, but they were never authorized to function fully as priests. So they had hints of priestly ministry, but really they were just kings. And some priests, especially after the king kingdoms fell, um, acted as governors, and so they had some kingly roles, but they were still just priests. The only person who was both a priest and a king after Melchizedek is Jesus. And so Melchizedek becomes this odd and beguiling picture of Jesus. He is both a priest and a king. He offers bread and wine as a sacrifice before God with Abraham, or Abram, as he was still known. Again, very interesting images, very familiar in Christianity. And the author of Hebrews picks up on this and also points out that Melchizedek has no patronage, has no family, no genealogy. He has no identity. It's as if he just appeared out of nowhere and became a priest and king. It's as if he never died because there's no record of his birth or death. And so there's a timelessness to this character of Melchizedek. And all we can do is look to the fact that wherever he came from and wherever he ended up, God is the one who made him a priest and God is the one who made him a king. And it is exactly like that, the author of Hebrews says, that we can look to Jesus, who has also been appointed a high priest by God, according to a promise. He didn't inherit the priesthood, like in the regular Old Testament, Old Covenant system. Uh, the descendants of Aaron were the priests, and that was just how it was. But Jesus obviously is not descended from Aaron. He's from a different tribe of the Israelites. He's from the tribe of Judah. This is detailed very clearly in the genealogies. So he has no claim to the Levitical priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood. Rather, the priesthood Jesus has is one appointed by God himself and taken upon himself as the God-man, the man who is fully God. Two different psalms are uh, pointed to in the course of what we heard from Hebrews. Uh, Psalm 110 was referenced, where it says, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then also Psalm 2. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Actually, no, that's Psalm. They're, they're both Psalm 110. Two different quotes from the same Psalm. Sorry, Psalm 2, I think, has a, a slightly similar reference, but not to Melchizedek. So Psalm 110 is used in addition to Genesis 14 to give a picture. And this picture is of Jesus, the high priest, who is going to mediate a new and better covenant, offering a new and better sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, in fact, one that only has to be made once. He points out in Hebrews that the other priests in the Old Testament system have to offer sin, sin offerings over and over again, because people keep sinning, and they themselves keep sinning, and most importantly, the sacrifices that they offer don't actually solve the problem. The sacrifices that they offer don't actually remove every sin. They appease God in the light of sin that has been committed already, according to his command and promise, but they don't actually take away the sin. And so the imperfection of God's people remains. They are reminded of their sinfulness in these sacrifices, and they are promised some kind of forgiveness by God in these sacrifices, but it doesn't quite give them the full solution. And that is what Jesus does as the high priest. And now we come to a very familiar gospel territory. Jesus offers himself on the cross as the sacrifice for sins. But you have to think about what does the high priest do? He offers the sacrifice, and there's multiple steps to that. You kill the animal to be sacrificed, you shed its blood, 
You do that outside of the camp, outside of the temple precincts. And then you bring the body and blood of that animal, or certain body parts, depending on what type of sacrifice. Then you bring it into the temple, and you bring it to the altar, and there you burn certain parts. You pour out the blood on the altar. Certain parts are eaten, depending on what kind of sacrifice we're talking about in the law. And that is what we see our Jesus doing here as our high priest. He has been slaughtered as, a, as the lamb to be slain outside of the temple, here on earth, in the world, in, in, within creation. And then in the ascension, he, our high priest, ascends into heaven. He enters the temple. He brings his body and his blood, his humanness, his humanity, his real body and his real blood before the throne of God. He sits at the right hand of God, and that sacrifice is complete. And it even says, he has been exalted above the heavens. He has no need to offer sacrifices daily, for he did this um, once for all. Uh, and in verse 25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus, the great high priest, has entered the Holy of Holies, the truest temple of all, the presence of the triune God, in fullest glory, unfettered, and he makes intercession for us. He is praying for us. His body and his blood is before the Father as a sign of the sacrifice that he has made for us. So when we celebrate with bread and wine, celebrating the sacrament of his body and blood here on earth, we're participating in his heavenly intercession. We are sharing in the sacrifice that he made for us. When we receive his body and blood, we receive his life. We receive the sign of the covenant that God has promised, not only life, but eternal life free from sin, cleansed from sin. This new covenant of perfection. This is what God offers to his people through Jesus Christ. And as we celebrate Ascension Day, one of the several things that we are remembering is the entrance of Jesus, our high priest, into his temple, his truest holiest, glorious temple, where he lives forever to make intercession for us. That's pretty amazing. All I can say is thanks be to God, and amen. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity.